Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Oh, our belly's full of pasties and baguettes and lots of carbohydrates. Hopefully that's good. Hopefully the food coma isn't kicking in because uh, we'll mitigate that in a sec. But as Tony said, I'm Chris. I run my own company called Controlled Frenzy, and I'm a creative technologist. And hopefully at the end of this workshop, we'll get you playing with, you'd have played with the Loving Grace technology, played around with a bit of processing and P5. There is interactivity and JavaScript, if that's a dirty word, Ooh. JavaScript in this session. So if you want to play along, and there will be times to play along, make sure you've got a laptop open or you're around someone with a laptop as well. So you can have a look and have a play. Uh, you will also need to be on the Wi-Fi as well, so hopefully that stays up as well. But in the meantime as well, as laptops are opening, as people start to fiddle around, I think we need to wake up a bit. I think we need to get moving. So if I could get everybody to stand up. Now, I work with a lot of artists and a lot of artists who are working with movement and dance. And that will be a core part of what we do today is we'll look at dance and movement data as well. But I'm going to start by teaching you an exercise Ben Dunks from Attic Dance taught me as well, and that's doing circles. So I want you to stand up straight, shoulders back, and I want you to start moving one of your shoulders around in a circle. So this is all about teaching your body to move in a controlled way. So with that arm, start moving that circle further down your arm. That's it. And now do the other arm. See if that can get going as well. And make those circles progressively bigger and bigger. Get a leg in. Start moving your body round and start drawing out those circles. You're starting to feel your body, your brain wake up. Now, move one of your hands across the other side of your body, like this. And by doing that, your brain is working extra hard to figure out where its placement is. And in research, what we've learned is if you get primary school kids to do this, their brains wake up after lunch. They get ready to learn, and their body's thinking, because their body's thinking about what they're doing and how they're moving. Brilliant. We all feel awake? All good? You can sit back down now. <laughs> Cool. Brilliant. Fantastic. Hopefully that made a good few pictures for Twitter as well. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, yes, as I said before, I'm a creative technologist and I run my own business called Controlled Frenzy. I work with artists, businesses, scientists, academia, all sorts of different clients to explore and do interesting stuff with te creative technologies. And I thought, let's blitz through a few examples, the sort of things I do. So here's me ripping apart a talking doll and installing a Raspberry Pi into it, giving it its own intelligence so we could talk to it about what it is, what its batteries are made of, and all sorts of things. Um, here's another project I did last year, which we're just about to publish a paper on, on teaching computers and AI to understand fish. And here's a sensor project. So here's an IoT project where we're looking at air quality and my walks around Plymouth, which were slightly disturbing. Maybe it's the reason why I've got asthma, I don't know. And more recently, one of my big projects has been something called the Common Line, which is planting a line of trees across the longest stretch, stretch of Great Britain, and then using augmented reality to explore and find the trees in those spaces as well. And then looking at how we can teach computers to build generative adversarial networks to generate new trees to plant along that line. So it's a bit of an interesting wide breadth of work, but I'm also a generative slash algorithmic and interactive artist. So if I go between generative and algorithmic over the course of this workshop, that will be why, because I kind of use both terms. And that means to make art that, as well as being interactive, is generated through algorithms, is generated through codes. And we're going to have a look at today is one of my key projects called Loving Grace. Now, Loving Grace started with this. These are self-portraits. These are portraits of my voice and my personality. Now, that's me speaking into a microphone, which is then fed into Google Voice 
to pick out and transcribe it, and that's fed into IBM sentiment analysis to pick out and pull apart my personality. And then that's fed into an algorithm written in processing which generates these waveforms. It generates these spirals and shapes you're seeing. And today, we're going to play around with a web port of this, and we're going to start inputting data and bringing in data from another project. So I started, talk, started today getting you moving and dancing. And one of my key projects with Ben is to look and understand the value of dance, the value of workshops and moving for all sorts of different people. So we've done lots of work with primary schools and teenagers, lots of motion capture and motion sensing and playing it back in augmented reality. But we're also looking at the data and the impact that data has. So some of the work we're going to be doing over the next few months is going to be looking at how people in housing associations move. So we're going to attach accelerometers to them and motion sensors. And over the course of a few weeks and workshops, we're going to teach them to do improvisational dance like we just did there, like we were just using our bodies. And we're going to see if that has an impact on the amount of times they fall, the amount of times they get up in the evening, how many times they turn the kettle on, and how they can stretch and move. And we're going to do that through data. But me and Ben, we're both artists and creatives, so we decided to feed it through these algorithms, feed it through love and grace, and get these waveforms and these shapes. So after the few weeks, as well as telling their, showing how their bodies changed, we can create these displays and ways of showing them how they've changed, how they've moved as well in a really interesting artistic way. And this is what we're going to hopefully be making by the end of today, is you're going to get, an art, get access to the algorithms, play around, understand how kind of the strings and the puppeting works, and then we're going to start feeding different data sets into it. So we're going to play around with this to start off with, then we're going to feed in sound, so we're going to listen to the room, listen to the microphones, and then we're going to run some real-world data from one of the old people we work with in Plymouth. So, this is interactive and there are a few house rules. Um, there are no stupid questions at all. Um, feel free to stop me at any time, so I will run round and Tony's going to hopefully help me out a bit as well, making sure you're all set up. As I said, if you want to, you don't have to join in, but if you want to join in, get around the laptop, do some programming. There will be some bits I need you to follow on with, so I'll just do that to get your attention and point you in the right directions. And the key is to have patience. Some of this stuff, it may take a lot. It, you may be slow to load. Your laptop may be not be working as well. Give it some time and give it time to bed in. We've got, still got 45 minutes, so we've got plenty of time to get through everything as well. Hopefully that sounds good. Sounds good. Getting some nods in the room. Any objectives today? So I've introduced you to me in the projects. We're going to get you set up. We're going to get you loading up in the pages. And then we're going to start figuring out how this algorithm works, how it's responding to an input, how it's responding to data. Then we're going to try out and fiddle around with P5, which is the JavaScript library we're using to play around and generate these forms. And then we're going to turn on the sound mode, have a look through the code, see how that works, and then turn on the data mode, have a look around and see how that works, and play around with it and break things, and go from there. So. First URL today, first time to stop to go. Go to bit.ly forward slash lg dash test. I'll leave that up there as well for a few minutes. And get that page up. This works best in Chrome if you've got it, but it will also work in Safari and Firefox as well. And we'll go from there. So, and just stick your hand up if you need any help. If you have followed the link correctly, you should see this. So I'm just going to refresh that again. So once it loads, you should see something start to emerge. So you should see that line pattern come in above. Now, if you take your mouse or keyboard or trackpad and kind of start scrolling out and zooming out, and then you can click and drag and move this shape around. So it's a 3D object. We all got that? So it's a spiral. And this is the base out of all those images. So our code 
in one point is generating this spiral, this collection of waveforms. Now, on the left-hand side of the window, you should see a loving grace editor thing with lots of little dials and things you could play around with. Grab one and start sliding it. And then grab one and start sliding another one and see what happens. So we're all starting to play around with those forms. Cool. So you see there's OSC A, B, C, D on the left-hand side. And those distort the shape. <laughs> cool. That might be just dependent on the computer as well. So this is using WebGL, and this is rendering everything in the browser. So if your computer doesn't have as good a graphics processor, it may slow down a bit. But persevere anyway. Try making the window smaller as well. <laughs> cool. So we've got OSC A, B, C, D, which changed the shape and the form. No surprises what OSC red, green, and blue might do. I'll change that. It changes the colors. So that changes the colors that are going into the spiral. And the stroke size changes the width of what we're seeing. So how does this work? So this works through arrays and classes. So there is an array of waveform objects. So each of those lines is a JavaScript object. And then there's an array of those lines which are drawn out one by one from the center out to the edge. And then when we add the new form object, it takes the most recent set of those values. So it checks, OK, what's A, what's B, what's C, what's D? And then red, green, blue puts that into its object, puts that into its memory and draws that out to the page. And because we're going, doing it sequentially, one after the other, and we're running through the array, we get this effect. Where the first item picks that up, and then it draws all the way down to the end. And then the next item picks that thing up and draws all the way down to the end. And we do that every, every frame. So every time we're drawing to the screen, we're making changes, and it's bringing it into the center. So it's kind of acting like a black hole, but it's using that data structure to build what we see. OK. Right, so that's our start point. We've got inputs, and we're feeding that into an algorithm, and then we're outputting something as well. So our output is what we're seeing on the screen. And our process, our algorithm, is the processing code. And our inputs are what we're going to start playing with. Cool. So p5js.org is what this is being written in. So this is a port of processing, which used to be a Java library, which is something you could download, you could write code in, <coughs> and it was all meant for making these kind of generative, hand, generative arts. And the basic concept of that is every time you want to draw a line, you write a bit of code that says, line, here's the coordinates, and we build from there. And then every, we just build up complexity from that beginning point. So literally, all we're seeing in those outputs are just a series of lines mapped in 3D and then affected in some way. So we're building up and we're creating and we're generating something from that. And our inputs are the data that's being fed into that algorithm. So we've started with our debug mode, which allows us to play around with those initial inputs. Next, we're going to turn on the sound mode that allows us to talk to our laptops and uh, play around with how this looks and how that changes. And lastly, we're going to feed in some of that motion data 
and see how that plays around, how that affects the algorithm and what we're doing as well. The key thing to remember, going into our history mode, is the treachery of images. This is not a pipe. So what we're displaying on the screen is not the thing. It's like how we draw a graph to abstract and represent something. What we're looking at is not the actual movement, it's a representation, it's an abstraction of that thing we're trying to abstract. And that gives us our meaning. So back at the start when I said these are self-portraits, that's the meaning I give to the thing I'm saying. It's a key part of conceptualism and art practice is you have a description for the thing you're looking at. It's not just a pretty thing on the wall, it has a meaning, an intent, a design behind it as well. So our intent here, by the end of it, is to show an example of that motion data, show something growing and reacting and moving, because that's reflecting the thing we did at the start. And that's gonna give us our kind of insight. That takes us beyond just visualizing data, it's showing information, showing ideas in a different way by applying our meaning and our understanding to this project. So, the next link I want you to go to, bit.ly slash lg code dash code, and that will take you to an instance of the P5 editor. So, it's a web-based programming tool, and you'll see how awful my JavaScript is, and it's really bad like really, really bad. I've not really done anything in ES6, so if someone wants to rewrite it, please, please go ahead. And we'll start showing you through it. Tony's gonna run around and make sure you're all on the right page. And then we'll start going through and looking how this works, how this makes sense, how we understand it. So, you should see a window that looks a little bit like this once you've gone to that link. And this is just a programming environment like any other, but it's specifically designed for playing around with P5 and sharing sketches and playing around with stuff. So, unsurprisingly, what do you think will happen if you press the play button? It will play our sketch in the window. But it's a little bit compressed on my side as well. Cool. So in here, on the left-hand side, there's our project folder, which has got all the files we need to run this program, to run this sketch. In the middle is our editor, where we can see and play around with the code. And on the right-hand side is our preview. So that's showing us what we've written and, what, and what's changing as well. So on the left-hand side, I just want, want you to make sure you're in sketch.js mode. And I want to make your first change to the code. If you've not done JavaScript before, welcome. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. You're not going to set fire to anything. Okay, you might set fire to something, but hopefully not anything in here. So, first thing I want you to do is that true statement. So, var debug equals true. We're going to turn off that window. We're going to hide the debug view because it's kind of blocking our path. So, let's turn it off. So, instead of debug equals to true, I'm going to change that to debug equals false. And then I'm going to hit run. And Tony's going to check and make sure everyone's doing it right. <laughs> and we'll see on the right hand side, unsurprisingly, our debug window has disappeared. Hooray! If that was your first experience with JavaScript, congratulations. It wasn't so bad, was it? No? Hopefully not. Cool. Okay. So, now, this code, this sketch.js thing, I want you to start scrolling through it and having a look and seeing what's going on. So, there's a ton of variables to start off with. Things like our OSC A, B, C, D, and the min and max values they can be. And then things like order, oh, there's our waveforms array. There's some rotating vectors and other things going on. Loads more booleans and other objects and stuff. 
And as we scroll down, we get to a set of functions. Now, there's three core functions in P5. So P5 kind of abstracts and makes some bits of JavaScript simpler. But the first one is preload, which is something that needs to happen before anything else runs. So that might be loading in fonts or images, or in this case, it's going to load data. Setup is our second important function. Setup is something that needs to happen at the start of the sketch. So at the start of the thing we're running, the setup is setting things up. It's setting key variables. It's setting the size of the window. It's setting things like the background color. So let's change the background color, for example. Let's make that FF and click Run again, and the background turns blue. So let's change that back. So there's a few other bits and pieces here, and you'll see there's a if sound. Then it sets up a mic and a FFT analyzer, and then if data, it sets an interval. But scroll down further, and you'll see draw. So the function draw in P5 is your most important function. It's the thing that runs every time we generate a frame. So the way P5 works is we have to tell it what to do every frame, every time we draw something to a screen. Now, remember back to school? Remember when you were learning animation and how animation works? How it's a set of frames, one after the other, and then your eyes are tricking you into thinking it's animating? This is exactly what's happening here. So we're effectively telling the programming code, here's that, move that bit, next frame, move that bit, next frame, move that bit, next frame, and then our body our eyes trick that, that's a smooth motion. And that's exactly what's happening here, only we are redrawing everything we see on the screen every time we draw a frame. Now that's the basics, that's what we need to know, but let's scroll down a bit further. And you'll see there's a background and a stroke. So the background flushes out the background and sets everything to blank. And the stroke sets what color we're going to draw things at. And then we're going to loop through and eventually get to where we start drawing our waveforms. So this is that array I was talking about, waveforms.push. And we're adding in a new class, a new object, which is storing all the data to draw one of those lines. And the further we go along, we see our last two key bits of functions in our draw. So if waveforms.length is greater than bh underscore size, waveforms.shift, what do you think is happening there? Shift. Yep. Shift. Almost, but in JavaScript terms. That's it. So we're adding in our new reading, our new set of data at the start of the array well, at the end of the array, and we're taking off the one at the start, and we're shifting everything along. And that's what you're seeing on the screen. And the last one is just looping through all the waveforms and calling a display function, which then draws something out into the screen. So before we go on to sound, I just want to click on to waveform.js on the far left. You'll, start, you'll see my function map color, function map alpha, map height, and then scroll down, you'll see this function waveform. Again, my JavaScript is old school. Please bear with me. I will learn ES6 eventually. <laughs> so that's then taking in those initial bits of data and information and setting up the object. And then it's just adding to its prototype a display function, which is the drawing algorithm as well, which is what we see there. And that's where we create the shape. And we do some gnarly maths on each of the inputs to generate where it is in that 3D space. So you'll notice there's lots of bits I've commented and uncommented. And this is one of the processes of being a creative technologist is try something, see it, oh, it didn't work, uncomment, recomment, try that again, try that again, try that again. You can do a bit of that in a bit. But the first thing I want to do is we're going to start, let's make this interactive. Let's make this 
do something a bit more interesting than draw a black frame with a basic sculpture like that. So let's go back over to sketch.js. And let's scroll way up to the top. And we're going to do our second bit of JavaScript programming today. If you had your first introduction, you're not going to believe what's going to happen in the second. Where it's, we're going to turn on the sound mode. So we're going to turn on the microphone. And we're going to see what that does to this. So instead of var sound is equal to false, let's change that to true. And then just hit run again. So it should pick up your microphone. So if it's worked well, it should like ask permission to use the microphone. And now start playing with it. Start talking into your microphone or talking really loudly. Maybe sing a song, do a tap dance. Mm -hmm. Is that all starting to make sense? All starting to come together, getting some thumbs up? Notice on some machines it is running a little bit slower. Um, one of these things, one thing, one issue in P5 at the moment is if you've got a high resolution screen, because it's generating four times the amount of pixels for that display, it slows down a little bit as well. So that's fine, that's a bug we can fix later. But what's happening here is it's taking everything it hears and it's splitting it down into 16 channels, basically 16 chunks of the frequency. And it's passing that data on to the OSC ABCD values to then change and distort the form. And then that's picking up and it's running through that set of waveforms. So what we see here is the sound over a few seconds. Because we're making it change and making it move, it's moving that sound down that waveform. So what we're seeing is data over time. A bit like a graph where we draw it that way and we do a, a fluctuation that way, say energy, time over there. We're kind of compressing that and turning that into our form. And that gives us a really interesting effect because we're looking at things over time. We're looking at things change. And we're turning that into some kind of graphic, some kind of input. So let's move on to looking at some real world data as well. So on the left hand side of the screen, in our project folders, you'll see there's two JSON files under the data folder. There's readings.json and there's rotations.json. So these are two sets of files, I think from Gladys in Plymouth Community Homes. So over our whole workshop, she wore a little Arduino motion sensor on her wrist. And she wore that for every single one of the workshops we did with them. 
So this is, I think, from the second workshop, these, these two files. So there's two files, one for accelerometer readings, and one for rotations that came from a gyroscope. So these are real-world data sets. So our accelerometer readings are broken into X, Y, and Z for going in three different axes. So it's X, Y, and Z, relative to where the wrist was as well, but that's a whole other discussion in accelerometry for net later. See me after the class if you want an in-depth discussion on how data relates to wrists and movement and X. Yeah, it gets complicated, but it's simple for now. So, X, Y, Z, and then alpha, beta, gamma for rotations from our gyroscope. So it's alpha, beta, and then gamma for going round as well. So obviously our person isn't doing backflips in it as well, although she might do. But we're taking those two data sets and we're turning that into what we're seeing on the screen. So we're going to do our third bit of JavaScript programming. Again, very exciting, very, very difficult, very intense programming this. I want you to go back to sketch.js. I want you to scroll all the way to the top. And we're going to change sound back to false. We're going to turn off this mode. And then we're going to turn data to true. And that will turn on our data mode. So that will load those JSON files and then start playing them back into the sketch. So you should start to see some slightly different forms emerging this time. Kind of looks like an 80s album cover at the moment. And that new wave, maybe? <laughs> So this is the same algorithm. This is the same thing as the sound, same thing we was doing as before, but we're just changing the input. And this gives us a different result. So what we're doing here is we're playing back that data. We're playing back the readings and rotations. Every reading we've got, we're feeding it into the algorithm every few seconds to show us what's going on, to show us how it's moving. So to see how that works, on sketch.js, scroll down, and eventually you'll get back to the setup function. And as we go down further, you'll see if data. So if our data mode is on, we're going to set an interval with a function called update waveform with data. Very good at naming functions. And that's going to happen every two seconds. So 2,000 milliseconds, two seconds. And that's then going to loop through our data set. So it's going to move forward every two seconds to get the next set of readings and reapply them into our algorithm. Now that is happening in the control.js file. So we go back onto the left-hand side, click control.js. There's some more functions here with more stuff going on. And scroll all the way down to the bottom again. And you'll see function update waveform with data. And the last key thing I'm going to get you having a look at and doing more JavaScript if you feel a bit comfortable, feel a bit up to it, is to look at how our data maps in here. So you see, these are our variables from the start. O, C, A, B, C, D, red, green, blue. And then there's a map function on the other side as well. Now, a map function is a really useful function in P5. You've probably seen it in other languages, but it takes one scale of data and applies it to another. So say we were counting in tens, but we wanted to translate that to hundreds. 
we'd say in a map function, anything between 0 and 10, map that to 0 and 100. So if we say 4 before, that would turn into 40, because the JavaScript is mapping that function out. And that's what we're doing here, is we're taking and combining some of those readings to feed them into those data points, and we're mapping them to the range our algorithm is expecting. So we could take any data set, we could turn this, we could say this is temperature, and take a temperature value, and know that probably goes from like minus 10, I don't know how cold it gets in Cornwall, I think minus 10 is way too cold, to maybe like 50 degrees at the top, and I mean we can apply that and map that to the data our system is expecting. So it does the hard work for us for figuring out that mathematics. So, to kind of give you the last part of this, last few minutes, I want you to start playing around with these maps. So have a look at OSCA, you see it, it goes maps, readings.x, data index, and then it goes minus 1,000, 1,000, minus 100, 100. So this function is expecting a set of inputs. The first input is the data we're sending into it. So we're sending, in our array of readings for, for the X plane, we're saying we're expecting it to be between minus 1,000 and 1,000. And then we're mapping it to what the algorithm is expecting, which is minus 100 and 100. So all I want you to do to start and to finish up and start generating and seeing what we create is play around with those numbers. Take some zeros out, maybe change them to twos, maybe move the minuses and the pluses. See what you get and see how they translate. You'll notice some of the ones at the bottom, the, the, the uh, colors are all combinations of different readings. Play around with them. Play around with those numbers and see what you get. If you manage this, then you are definitely a creative technologist. You are fiddling, you are playing, you are seeing what looks good and doing the next thing and trying the next thing after that and going from there. So let's have a play with that and see where we go. So there are two things I want to show you before we close out tonight. <laughs> Not a surprise. <laughs> so two things we're going to show you. One is how to save your work. Very important, very important to save your work. So P5 is really nice, at least this P5 editor, because it's easy to share and do things. So you can create an account with P5 on the right-hand side. You can just click My Account. You can sign in with GitHub or create your own thing as well. And when you're on the page and you've made some edits, you can save it to your own account by clicking File and then Duplicate. And then that makes a copy of everything that's here in your own P5 account, ready for you to play around with and hack on as well. So that's the first thing to show you, saving your work. The second thing is different modes. So we've got our sound mode, and we've got our data mode, and our debug mode. But at the moment, they've been quite discreet. But there's no reason why we can't have more than one mode on and add that to our meaning. So what if we wanted to create an interactive artwork that we could interact with and play with and perform and dance or sing along or speak to someone else's moving the motion? So just by combining those two ideas together, we get something interesting, we get something new to play around with. So let's go back to sketch.js, scroll up to the top, and let's see what happens if we have two modes at the same time. So let's have the sound mode on and the data mode. So both the data that's been input from, our, from Agnes, I think it was Agnes, and our sound, the way we're talking, the way we're singing, let's combine them both together and see what we get. So now you start seeing those two data sets working together. You've got those smooth lines, the accelerometer, but kind of the mess of the sound. 
But now the meaning of this has changed because it's two different things creating an artwork, two different sources feeding into an algorithm, generating something new. So here, my voice is working with that motion data, work, something from the present, working with something from the past, creating something new, generating and bringing the algorithms together. And this shows you the power and what we can do with these technologies and what we can make. This was just the starting point. But as you know, technology is evolving and there's a lot of questions around what we can do, what we can enable it, we have to be considerate. We have to think about what we can do. And we can use art, we can use algorithms, we can explore them and interrogate them in different ways. And it's an interesting starting point and it's a way to go for it. Think about what you do. Think about how you can turn something you do into something creative. Taking data from one output and just feeding into something and see what happens and think about what that means. Think about what that tells and what story that tells. And with that, I'll hand back to Tony and say thank you very much.